Today we are beginning a cycle of conferences, which is very interesting, especially for the agricultural sector, rural areas, agri-food sectors, and very especially to offer quality services, which are timely and provide good coverage for small and medium producers, who are the main actors of food production. The rural sector and especially agri-food systems have faced great challenges in the past decades, and these have not been solved. We have climate change and the impacts it brings with it, pesticides and other impacts on the agri-food systems, plus the latest one, the pandemic and health-related issues that we all know about. This forces us, all of those who work or are related to the sector, to look for ways to produce and provide services so these products can be high quality products that can help supply the world with food. These uh, events such as uh, natural events, hurricanes, like last season we had two hurricanes, uh, big hurricanes coming one after the other and something that's not frequent in nature. Then we have the pandemic, the decreased mobility that came with that, the impossibility of meeting producers face to face has led us all to find new ways to communicate. This includes uh, finding ways to provide services and support them through digital means by using radio, television, apps, internet, etc. The Ministry of Agriculture in Brazil, AICA, FAO, Relacer, and ECLA want to bring all these experiences together. Everything that has come up uh, to cover these needs, and we'd like to share them so that they can be used by all that are involved in production and in guaranteeing food for our population. Today, we are beginning a series of seminars with the main focus of technical assistance and uh, extension services through digital means. We don't want to say the digitalization of agriculture, or we don't want to talk just about that. That's probably our main goal later on, but step by step, looking at some of the experiences that have come up in the world and very specifically in Latin America and the Caribbean. So the seminar series will uh, have five different, six different uh, dates of seminars. Today we are going to be talking about policies and strategies to support digitization in the provision of extension services and to help improve agriculture. On April 14th, we have the second event with the same goals, open to the whole Latin American region. We have then the third event. The second one is for the Spanish speaking region. The third is for the English speaking Caribbean. And on the 21st and 22nd of April, we have seminars with Brazil and Portuguese. 
Portuguese speakers. And with this series of seminars, we want to gather all the experiences that have been popping up, looking at lessons learned in the supply of technical assistance in these new conditions and under the new reality with the health-related events and climate-related events that uh, force us to rethink. Without anything further, I'd like to now give the floor to Mr. Federico Villarreal, Director of Technical Cooperation of AICA. He will be giving his welcoming remarks. Go ahead, Federico. Thank you, Maria Auxiliadora. And good morning, everyone. I'd like to first uh, greet our panelists and allied organizations for the first uh, cycle on the provision of uh, technical assistance and rural extension services aimed at rural producers in Latin America and the Caribbean. As uh, Maria was saying, uh, we have RELACER, ECLAC, FAO, and MAPA from Brazil and especially our panelists of today, Sandra Ziegler, Luis Carlos Veduski, Octavio Sotomayor, Delgirma Chulubantar, Heiner Baumann. E-commerce and uh, technical assistance and rural extension are at the heart of ACA's work and of course, part of the family agriculture program led by Mario León under technical uh, assistance in an institute. This is still a topic that has not been resolved uh, as many others in our region, and we need much work to improve that. In that sense, we have the seminar to address that. There's several institutional models with important economic and uh, human resources from ministries and others. And it's also an important topic for agriculture and rural areas, most especially given today's context. The crisis we are living through has led to the creation of platforms and apps that are very innovative and are transforming our society and rural areas. They are transforming the ways in which we communicate, produce, trade, and even think about technology and think about our cells using technology. Technological processes that are geared at increasing productivity in our systems should go a step further to ensure compatibility and access to markets, thinking about the demands of consumers and not so much in supply. The crisis and the virtual world we're living now in meant that we had to be cautious and see how to connect to others. It has helped us connect much more and it has brought supply and demand closer. Although it at the same time has also made us feel farther apart. So we have to think about technologies as process technologies, which will help us find the best end product for agricultural products, organization of value chains that are increasingly integrated with a single business plan that helps all the links in the chain coordinate better and more proactively. This series of seminars is complemented to the Hemispheric Forum on reducing gender, sorry, connectivity gaps in rural Latin America and the Caribbean. There we heard about the digital revolution in agriculture that we're going through. And in that sense, extension services and technology transfer are part of that. And this forum is precisely collaborating in that sense. We should highlight studies related to connectivity that we have been doing in IICA and that Sandra will be sharing with you. These uh, share some of the needs and contributions that we need to provide and how to progress. 
we are wor working hard with our strategic alliances and our partners today help us see that we can do this together. We also wish to share aligned solutions, apps for rural extensions, such as the one we are working with in the Caribbean. And strategic alliances that we are also going through with PAD to help transform extension services in several countries and in the region overall. Without anything further, I wish you much success. And I am sure that this forum will be very productive. And thank you all and greetings from our DG. Maria Auxiliadora, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. And greetings uh, to the Director General as well. We will now begin with our presentations. Just to let each of the panelists know, you will have 15 minutes for your presentation. When you have, when you're at the 10 minute mark, I will let you know visually, I'll raise my hand. And uh, when you are at your 15 minutes, I will probably be interrupting you to tell you to close your presentation. I know you all have very interesting presentations, but we do want to keep the time. Time is our worst enemy, so we want to be sure we respect everyone's time. And I will soon give the floor to the first presentation by Sandra Ziegler. Sandra has a PhD in social sciences and a master's degree in social sciences with emphasis in education from the Faculty of Exact and Natural Sciences at Flaxo, Argentina. She also studied uh, science, uh, education sciences in the University of Buenos Aires, and she is currently associate professor in the School of Exact and Natural Sciences and main researcher in the area of education at Flaxo, Argentina, where she leads the master's program in social sciences with an emphasis in education. Sandra is currently also a consultant of the Inter-American Institute on Cooperation for Agriculture, AICA. Sandra, you have the floor. 230 people are expecting you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, and it's an honor and uh, a pleasure to be here uh, to uh, submit a synthesis of three studies carried uh, at ICA in cooperation with other institutions. Um, uh, as you can see, here are the three different um, research projects, uh, Digital Gender Divide in Latin America and the Caribbean with ICA, the University of Oxford, the IDB and IFAD, connect, Rural Connectivity in the Americas and Latin America, and then finally, digital skills in the rural milieu together with the IDB uh, and Microsoft and ECA, of course. I My presentation will be brief. I will give you an overview of all three documents and uh, to serve as part of the discussion for this forum. To that end, next please. So I will share my screen again. Disculpen. And I apologize for that. Ahí está. Bueno, eh, voy a presentar básicamente... I will uh, speak to three topics. 
basically. First of all, I'll talk about the uh, significant connectivity access gap. Secondly, I will speak about the main problems around rural connectivity and strategies for a solution. And thirdly, uh, it's misnumbered, but number three, uh, digital skills in the rural milieu and options for adoption. So, uh, yeah. Um, as I said, the document on connectivity on rural connectivity has allowed us to put together a host of information about the status of connectivity in the region, specifically focusing on the issue of uh, the rural milieu. We have uh, developed uh, wor our work based on available data, and the purpose has been to measure the level, uh, the gauge the level of access and quality of connectivity based on um, country statistics and uh, draw comparisons between the rural and urban areas. As part of this, we have developed the, the significant uh, rural connectivity uh, index, which uh, includes several indicators such as uh, regular use of the internet, access to devices, data, and speed of connection. Based on the information collected through uh, official sources in, in, in the, each of the countries, this was um, extrapolated a use uh, uh, using as a basis the broadband index produced by the IADB, and this enabled us to gauge the rural connectivity in the region. What you can see here is gap between rural and urban areas. Connectivity is on average two times higher, twice as high in um, in urban areas as vis-a-vis uh, -vis rural areas. So you can see on average that 63% of, uh, of rural dwellers have no access to significant connectivity. Um, if we take out Brazil, which is a major element, we'd say actually without Brazil, 70 over 75% of uh, rural dwellers have no significant connectivity. The green line shows the status or the state of rural co connectivity and blue is what needs to be done to bridge that gap between urban and rural connectivity. Based on the broadband um, uh, index um, of the IADB, we've been able to do uh, an extrapolation for 24 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And according to this, 77 million of uh, rural dwellers have, in, in these 24 countries, have no access to connectivity with the minimum quality standards. Um, we have also divided the countries into three uh, categories, low, intermediate, medium, and high connectivity, which are color color coded in uh, on the slide. This uh, during this study, we have uh, um, surveyed um, several uh, key uh, respondents who have allowed us to analyze the major infrastructure problems that um, are impeding connectivity. There are seven major problems, which I will summarize here. And in doing so, I believe, I dare say that there are obsolete, outdated regulatory frameworks, which need to be reviewed and revised. Oftentimes, regulatory frameworks refer to older um, legacy technologies. There are problems with uh, um, the in installation or, or setup because of lack of infrastructure, especially in more remote areas in the countries. Also, there is um, lack of a, a infrastructure map with information on telecommunication networks to identify areas that are have gone uncovered and uh, may be poten potentially connected uh, to the grid. And also high investment costs and less cost effectiveness for lower cost effectiveness for operators, for companies. There is lack, there is a, a, a lack of stimuli and um, and uh, all to um, encourage uh, investment in the rural area. And finally, uh, last but not least, the um, lack of affordability of uh, devices and higher cost of, of uh, mobile telef uh, telephony and internet services um, for rural dwellers. Aside from connectivity and infrastructure, the studies that I mentioned have also identified the problem of uh, 
digital skill development in the rural milieu. First of all, um, there is, is the issue of uh, digital skills because we feel that although um, connectivity is a necessary condition, precondition for um, people uh, to bridge this gap, um, it is not enough. There is a need also for skills to be acquired by the population to um, maximize to make the maximum use of what uh, connectivity has to use and put them to the service of um, of agri-food systems. There's all, we're also going through a major technological revolution uh, globally, and there's a need to acquire these skills in order to re-qualify and uh, the uh, labor and so as to make it um, so as to prepare it for the current labor market. Um, the, uh, there is a direct link between uh, digital links, uh, digital um, skills and the results on productivity in terms of productivity. Uh, the OECD in 2020 uh, indicated that an increase in the order of 1% in, in simple ICT um, competences is uh, associated to a 2.5% increase in uh, work productivity and a 1% a increase in complex IT, um, ITC skills will lead to a 3.7% increase in productivity in the workplace. Um, we have also uh, carried out a survey and uh, an analysis of studies and research done in the region about the development of digital skills. And we have also looked into cases and um, uh, so study cases about um, development and teaching um, and, and training in the area in the region based on the found findings that we had for Latin America and the Caribbean in terms of digital skills. There are a few topics that stand out. First of all, studies indicate that the use of in the internet in the rural milieu is uh, happen happens more often by those who have uh, more schooling, those who come from higher income homes and who carry out uh, higher skilled um, rural uh, tasks and who have access to technological tools. Also in the region, there is differential uh, and, and, and access to to uh, these uh, according to gender. So access to by women to um, cellular uh, uh, telephony in Latin America and, and the Caribbean is, is um, lower than that of men. And this in turn leads to lack of access to production and also in terms of uh, family care and the uh, creation of learning opportunities, etc. So the fact that women have less access to uh, mobile telephony is actually restricting their opportunities for development. Also, there is agreement as to the fact that the those who most often use technology in the rural milieu are children and youth. They are the door into the rural milieu for these technologies. And there's also the role of schools, which uh, encourage the use of the internet. We've seen uh, several studies uh, with survey data that indicate that when there are children and youth in rural milieu, in rural um, households, there is more use of the internet and these technologies. They um, start with uh, being used um, gradually first for for um, just for entertainment, and then they're used more systematically for for teaching, learning, etc. And uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic has sped up the use of technologies for e commerce in the rural milieu, and it has been used even more and more intensively over the last year. As part of this um, uh, this research on digital skills, we have identified several strategies for the adoption of such skills in the rural milieu. We uh, carried out a survey about experiences that uh, and, and research about experiences underway, and we put together 14 cases that are explained in detail in 
our uh, research paper. I will, all I have is five minutes left, but I will mention the seven major strategies that we have been able to uh, identify. First of all, initiatives that are bolstering communities to promote technological uh, skills and digitization. We're talking about uh, women-centered, and indigenous women-centered and youth-centered uh, initiatives to bolster the use of such uh, skills and de develop them. Secondly, there are several initiatives meant to promote e-commerce in agriculture as another way in for um, digital skills to um, penetrate and permeate this the region. Also, programs for training programs uh, such as the Microsoft Initiative and others. Uh, Microsoft has free courses online provided to teach uh, technological skills. Uh, number four, uh, smart farming strategies uh, through the use of drones, satellites, and sensors, which allow for um, information and data to be gathered and, um, and conveyed about um, various practices in agriculture, farming, ranching, etc., which is on the rise in terms of use. Number five, the development of specialized digital consulting strategies. Uh, that was mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, such as Precision Agriculture for Development, uh, um, it, which is carried out by ECAPAD and the Ministry of Agriculture of Brazil. Uh, and in the future, we will be working with Colombia as well to allow for uh, cell phones to be used for extension services, to provide information for agriculture and for farmers to have useful and substantive information to improve their work. Number three, uh, seeking solutions to encourage digitization in the rural areas, such as hackathons. And um, the idea is to find specific solutions for the use of technology in agriculture and the rural milieu. And finally, the, um, the uh, competitive funds to uh, um, obtain funding for um, small and medium-sized uh, farmers to use technology in agriculture. Finally, uh, we have a few recommendations and uh, that this book of this I will conclude. These are recommendations that summarize what uh, was found in the various documents. Number one, there is a need to develop uh, public policy in this area. There is a need to support and encourage states to um, develop these policies and implement them in cooperation with the various stakeholders involved, uh, to wit states, the private sector, international organizations, and co-ops. Also, to encourage investment by the public and private sector alike, um, there is a need to promote connectivity in the rural milieus and the development of uh, digital skills uh, programs for um, the rural milieu, and also bearing in mind the diverse audience that you are um, aiming at. Um, for example, women are different from the, from, from the young or from indigenous women, etc. That needs to be borne in mind. There is the issue of cost and act, lack of access to services and devices. There is a need to have content and digital content and resources that are in keeping with the cultural uh, diversity and linguistic diversity that permeates the region. And finally, the need to develop training programs. Um, first of all, um, bearing in mind the generational um, replacement and children and the young who will uh, be taking over um, work in agriculture and also currently active uh, urban, uh, the urban population so as to improve um, productivity and the enhance their digital uh, skills. Thank you for your attention. And here's the link for you to be able to read those three documents. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you for having kept it within the 15 minutes, so right on time. For those of us following the audience, any questions you have, ask them in the chat box. 
we will be gathering the questions and at the end we'll answer the ones uh, time allows and the rest of the questions will be analyzed and addressed later with you. Our next panelist is Mr. Luis Carlos Beduski. He is a policy officer of the FAO Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Since 2016, he has worked as such and he coordinates the areas initiative mano a mano hand in hand to ensure we have prosperous and inclusive rural societies. Mr. Beduski is an agricultural engineer with a master's and PhD by the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he's also an associate professor of the School of Arts, Sciences and Humanities at the Institute of Advanced Studies of Sao Paulo University with over 20 years of experience preparing, implementing and evaluating policies, programs and projects for rural development, food security, and environmental management. Mr. Beduski will be sharing the strategy for the digitization of agriculture and extension services from the perspective of the FAO. Mr. Beduski, you have the floor, 15 minutes. And everyone is ready to hear you. Thank you, Maria Auxiliadora. I have to begin by greeting you and all my colleagues and friends that I see in the panel. Hi, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to share with you in this activity. For me, this uh, seminar has a very important symbolic and political dimension. On the one hand, it reinforces the joint work of ECLAC, AICA, and FAO in thinking about the challenges and ways forward to promote sustainable rural development in our region. And also because we also have the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock uh, from Brazil uh, as a partner in this seminar series. And for FAO, it's a long uh, history of collaboration with the ministry in different uh, programs. So for a while, we have been partnering with them in rural extension in the region through the support uh, to Relacer, the network of Relacer. So I will share my screen. And uh, I have to say that Sandra's presentation and her work helps me a lot too to introduce my topic. She showed the challenges we have, especially in terms of connectivity in our region. And it's no surprise to us really, because our region is truly marked by this great inequality. That's something that is a uh, uh, core characteristic of our region. The difference between different social groups and inequalities. And this was shown very explicitly. And this again, is also reflected in the use of digital technologies. So the first thing is that the pandemic, COVID-19, did accelerate the use of technology worldwide. And this was no different in the rural world. Agriculture had already started this of innovation and digitization these changes were accelerated by the pandemic. And we don't truly understand the magnitude of these changes right now, as we heard from Sandra. We need to find a way to better comprehend and 
take advantage of the acceleration of these processes of digitization as they open new opportunities for agriculture, especially family farming in the region. They can help us accelerate processes to increase efficiency and productivity. They can accelerate the whole transformation of the rural sector and uh, food systems. And here at FAO, we have a meeting every two years. Uh, for those who are not aware of it, in system uh, to guide our work plans. Every two years, there's a meeting. And so we had already anticipated that one of the main drivers of transformation would be uh, digital innovation. And this means that they can help increase productivity and efficiency and something very important for FAO, having a true impact on equality. They also bring great opportunities in terms of sustainability and environmental management. Some of the things I, I truly uh, like is everything that is being done now with forest monitoring using drones in my country and in Paraguay. There's interesting examples of work using drones to monitor deforestation. There's also monitoring of water resources, soils, weather, and thing related to the use of big data, machine learning, a series of possibilities to build scenarios, forecasts, and have integrated data networks. There's also, as we heard from Sandra, a big change, uh, not just because of technology, but there's that digital literacy process that goes hand in hand with that. And this can stimulate new innovations again. having technology, but especially what we're seeing in the countryside in Latin America, where the population is getting older, there's now space to have um, programs open up. For example, in Chile, there's a program called Nodo, where they find ways to link agri culture uh, digitalization. A fourth point, which might be obvious, but we have to say it, is that this leads to access and management of information in real time. It could be access to prices. For example, I remember in Costa Rica, there's this big game with wholesale markets um, where they play with the information they have available. And today, this is very simple to do because uh, producers have information in real time in their cell phones. There's also other innovations, such as uh, facilitating access to insurance with lower premium costs, um, using photographs also with your cell phone to purchase insurance. So there's a series of new applications and initiatives that can help. Uh, weather forecast, detecting pests and diseases, and even having uh, healthcare uh, evaluations with images, which also is important for rural agriculture. So coming back to the point raised by Sandra, the risks of having gaps widen, which we already have uh, as large enough gaps. There's differences between territories, between countries, between population groups, men and women. And this is also something we heard from Sandra. We have to face the heterogeneous effects. And for that, we need public policies that can help minimize these effects and this greater differentiation. This also brings along more uncertainty. The risks are uh, the fact that we don't really know where we are going. These are new 
realms. We have new stakeholders, new demands in markets and in society. We're also finding there's new ways to socialize, new ways to organize and manage. And again, these bring uh, along a sense of uncertainty, a risk that adds to the complexity of the equation. This new world, of course, requires new labor skills, not just in the labor market that has been very much affected. We will probably hear from ECLAC in this sense later on. Um, after the shock of the pandemic, we are faced with a very complicated scenario. And this means we need new competencies to operate in the new world of agriculture 4.0, as it's being called. And this brings us to the digitization of extension services for family farming. Uh, we have significant data uh, the agricultural units in the re region, about 15 million in the region, about 13 million can be considered family farming. And of course, they have challenges that make them face these uh, gaps in productivity. They may not have enough access to assets, services, or new ways of organizing themselves. And so here is where what we have been insisting on at there or the uh, technical assistance and rural extension as a key tool to help bring new life to family farming. And in the digitalization, there's a new opportunity also for these types of extension services. It can be less costly, more massive and instant. It can be more timely because of this and custom made. It can be done more frequently than previous models in the 80s and 90s. It can also be better adapted, technically speaking. And very importantly, it can be customized. It can be more collaborative. We see experiences, uh, Octavio Sotomayor led one that I still believe uh, was uh, wonderful when he was working with INDAP with a series of uh, with a network sorry, of uh, young people that uh, shared thoughts through WhatsApp. So this new digitization can help us close these gaps because we can create adapted content, helping differentiate the tools, strengthening digital education. But of course, with the challenge of access to equipment and digital connectivity. And this means we have to have a process of political construction. In my country's experience, for example, we had a program called Light for All, Luz Para Todos. And, and one of the biggest difficulties we found for family farming uh, was uh, public policies. We had to work with public policies and now we are at a time where access to internet may be as important as having access to electricity or water. At FAO, we have been working on this by suggestion of its member countries worldwide and regionally. So we have the commitment to accelerate digitalization of agriculture. And so we are very happy to be part of this seminar series because of that. I just uh, call your attention to a few of, of these, for example, the International Digital Council um, worldwide because of demands of member countries, um, everything that we have in our digital services portfolio. And every time I, I visit this, it's, it's more interesting than going to the Play Store because there's so many apps and new things to uh, play around with. Then we have the FAO Data Lab, uh, database and information uh, that's important for the world today to help connectivity. There's a, a series of information kits available linked to geospatial uh, data as well in the FAO geospatial platform 
So it's important to provide this and make it available for others. That's what I have uh, for you. And just to close, um, this is all linked to a greater process, which is uh, the, United, the United Nations uh, work on family farming. We have some more information on, on the whole process for those interested in visiting the platforms. Uh, we have the platform for family farming. Uh, and again, we have uh, partners at uh, ECLAC, uh, ICA, uh, IFAD and others. So we have much information. This is a Twitter uh, on family farming. And uh, to close, we have a global action plan coordinated uh, by countries and organizations with a rural uh, family farming form where we established seven pillars for a, an action plan to work towards our goals. Each of these pillars is directly linked to what we will be covering during these seminars on uh, rural extension and family farming. So I invite you to join us to the rest of ours and thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure that we will have a very interesting time for discussion and it will be very productive. Thank you very much. I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Luis Carlos. Uh, it's been a very um, illustrating um, presentation with uh, a great deal of innovative uh, factors. Um, I think that uh, digitizing agriculture hinges on reassessing agriculture as a whole and support services uh, in particular, especially innovation in the sector and uh, within innovation, how we address research to develop new technologies, including digital technologies, and um, the provision of extension services. Um, and as you were saying, uh, Luis Carlos uh, Relacer has been working for over 10 years together with other stakeholders involved in this forum, FAO, ECLAC, the Ministry of Agriculture of Brazil, ICA, all of us. So I am certain that we will come to very promising uh, conclusions at the end of this series of webinars. Next, we will hear from Mr. Octavio Sotomayor. He is the um, economic officer He's the economic officer at the Natural Resources Division at ECLAC. He's a, an agricultural engineer uh, from the University of Chile, and uh, he has a master's degree in economics at the uh, in uh, the University of Agroparis in France. He has been the director of the Agricultural Policy and Research uh, Department and also um, director of the Agricultural and Rural Development Department at INDAP in Chile. And he's now the advisor on economic affairs at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean ECLAC. Octavio will be speaking about the outlook for digitization of agriculture in Latin America from the standpoint of ECLAC. You have the floor, Octavio. Thank you, Maria Auxiliadora. I wonder whether while I share my screen and put up my, um, my presentation, I, I'll have enough time to thank you all and say what a pleasure it is to be here with all of my friends. And I would also like to send my greetings to the extension workers who are watching us today. He works, uh, they, they work with Relacer and they're out there in the field. 
and this presentation is meant for them from their standpoint. I want to stand in their shoes as if I were someone in the public sector working in the area. The main ideas in my presentation, and I will be uh, speeding up a little bit, are the following. We need to actually transform the system, the agri-food agri -food system, as uh, the, the previous speaker said. Secondly, uh, to apply a low-cost um, strategy to avoid immobility. Uh, this is uh, my main message. Uh, Third, um, digitization is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, technical assistance is counseling and is advice, but they, they need, you need to follow up on it with investment. So digitize, digitize technical assistance is not enough. There's a need for investment. And finally, and going back to the whole idea of transformation, the di digitization must be at the service of new paradigms, uh, which uh, in our case means bioeconomics and um, agri-ecological transition, as I said. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will be touching upon the fiscal situation in the country's low cost, um, food system digitization overall, and then I will talk about the main issue at hand, which is extension and marketing, and finally, my conclusions. So quickly, if I may, I don't think there is a need for us to go into details about this, but we're in the midst of a pandemic. This has had a major impact on fiscal um, aspects in our countries, in Latin America and the Caribbean. In, and this, in turn, has a major impact on the budgets of the ministries of agriculture and the, those um, the funds available for extension. This is to be expected. So over the next few years, we will find a fiscal uh, ourselves under a fiscal squeeze. And the question for all of us, the authorities and um, civil society leaders and um, companies, is what will we do? How will we respond uh, during the post-pandemic era where we'll have to relaunch the economy and uh, also avoid a new uh, systemic crisis such as the one we're undergoing now, uh, which uh, that means that we need to operate within the constraints of our planet. And also there's the political, uh, the political po power um, and, and forces and games are, everything is undermined and under a great deal of pressure. And finally, will we uh, leverage this crisis to uh, move towards a, a more well better balanced society which is more organic and integrated and uh, digitization is a tool in my view that should enable and, and and help this transition so i i said this in passing but uh we need to make family farming more dynamic and that calls for investment that needs to be borne in mind quite clearly our, in our profession over the last 20 to 30 years, we have come to accept the idea that public policy needs to be differentiated. Uh, policy for the young, for children, for, for different territories, for older adults. Um, there are so many categories, but what I would like to introduce in this presentation is a new uh, factor category, which has to do with cost. And to make it even clearer, I'd like to say that the challenge is to design low cost policy that will make it possible for us to lift ourselves out of the situation we are um, over the next um, few years. Sandra uh, spoke to the um, ECA, IADB and Microsoft uh, papers, and there are some very interesting um, homegrown solutions in there. And that's a concept that uh, goes back to another concept that we've been working on at CEPA, at ECLAC, which has to do with low cost or autonomous and own resource uh, funded activities or self-funded activities. And I'll explain what I mean by that. What I mean is that if we're going to design a, a, a public scope um, 
program, its scope. It doesn't have to be launched by the public sector, but it could be launched by a co-op or a company. But the idea is to make the best of all local leadership available, as well as all the resources available to all own resources available to uh, reduce cost, increase, qu improve quality, and also impact. The idea, this is uh, something we should use as um, as a target for for the next few years, and that also entails combining costs and local technology, traditional technology, with modern technologies, including digital type technologies. And this is very long, but I think that I should at least mention it. I think we need to learn to look at things, to relearn how to look at our territories. This is a guide, uh, just a list. I won't go into detail here, but um, you'll have it uh, for, for later reference. But uh, what we need to do is improve the way we assess the situation in rural um, territories so as to promote uh, family farming support programs. I think that the most emblematic one is one uh, about rain uh, water. In, in the past, rainwater was just lost. Now it's collected and used. And the same goes for biomass, for, for, for waste, for um, physical, uh, unused physical assets and skills, skills. Uh, and the technical knowledge of uh, urban dwell, uh, rural dwellers um, during the during uh, the uh, agricultural revolution or the green revolution, the um, farmers uh, were just the, the subject, so to speak. Uh, the farmer just received, um, it was a top-down approach from the experimental station um, that developed everything and just gave it to the farmers. This, this is completely outdated now. And this is very important for extension uh, purposes. Ag uh, farmers, I have uh, a great deal of very valuable uh, knowledge and that needs to be uh, tapped into. So this is the idea. We need to learn to work with local resources, of course, and of course, um, uh, external financing is very important. I will waste no time on this, but ideally we should have um, public uh, government uh, funded uh, programs and programs funded by international organizations and banks, but that will be hard to do in upcoming years. Um, now I would like to go into digitization proper. This is an interesting uh, picture. This was taken in England. This is a half hectare field with no human intervention. This is what is happening now. This is fast. It's inescapable. The pandemic has sped it up. It's very heterogeneous. It has an impact on employment, of course, and be mindful of the fact that it may also have an impact on remittances in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the pandemic has generated a great deal of stress so that um, the fields, the, the countryside in the north and in the south will become more digitized and this will have an impact on employment. This also means the creation of networks and uh, I will go into that uh, later, but mostly uh, digitization is uh, is uh, in keeping with this whole uh, low cost strategy. Sandra talked about gaps. I won't repeat her what, is, what she said. There are so many gaps everywhere and it's quite obvious to see. Uh, take a look at what uh, the situation is in Nicaragua. 38% um, uh, and this is just a small uh, sample of uh, the population in the mid development, um, medium development area. Only 38% of uh, the farmers have smartphones. I mean, it's not a lot, but it's something 38%, 50 out of 130. But uh, but 96% are of them are available to receive training through um, the uh, so social media and through uh, the internet. Take a look at, at Brazil, 7.5% of farmers uh, receive technical assistance in the Brazilian Northeast as compared to the South where the percentage is 45.5% in Northeastern Brazil. 7.5%, they have major coverage problems. And that is true of 
all, almost every single country in Latin America coverage and quality, of course. So how do we overcome the uh, divide, the, guy, the gap that Sandra referred to? Uh, well, broadband, um, uh, mobile telephony. Uh, what I'm interested in is talking about solutions, homegrown solutions, based on uh, the research that was presented by Sandra, which will put an end to the, the stalemate that we have, the stagnation. So that means that maybe we won't have broadband for one, two, or three years, but there are community-based solutions that in some aspects can put an end to the stagnation, which I find quite interesting. And I will We'll finally conclude by saying that the food system as a whole needs to be digitized. And here are some references, some, some papers uh, uh, being worked on by us with the, together with the FAO, also just by ECLAC about what is going on um, uh, with the digital divide. So finally, about uh, technical support and marketing. And uh, here are some data from Mexico. We carried out a survey last year about the pandemic. Uh, and based on that, the, uh, what we saw was that 68% of the uh, respondents said that they use platforms, they use um, IT platforms for technical uh, support, and 33% use it to access um, weather, price, market, pest, and disease data. Technical assistance is a very important aspect of uh, facing the pandemic that's agreed upon by 49.2% and uh, in terms of marketing as well, 21.1%. Uh, so with that, what I would like to say is that there are two programs which have been underway in the region for a long time, working on horizontal extension networks. One is in Peru, Haka Winyai, with 100,000 uh, farmers in the uh, mountains, in the Peruvian uh, mountain ranges, where uh, more experienced farmers um, counsel and advise uh, more novice uh, farmers. There's another one in Nicaragua, fostered by, supported by Funica, which is the farmer to farmer program. So this is a horizontal um, program without engineers, without vehicles, without a great deal of work and, uh, and public servants, but rather a network of farmers. Uh, I think the challenge is to replicate them using digital tools, do it online. And that's what we're doing. There is a process, uh, there's a project underway with Procasur and CRS in Nicaragua and Honduras with ECLAC, where we are trying to uh, create horizontal farmer-to-farmer uh, -farmer networks using cellular phones. And you can see the proportions there. This is, of course, linked to research, linked to our professional extension workers. And to those two components, we add advanced farmers at different levels. Here we see the model is from Chapingo, Mexico, where they have a network of innovators. And they have different waves of farmers using these and it goes as a cascade downwards. The first wave are those most advanced, the second coming later and so forth. There are many formats for this. What's truly relevant here is the work in networks. Every territory can adapt the network. So here we have uh, an experience by INDAP with the same concept from Peru and Nicaragua of horizontal extension was interpreted differently and we created a web page 
you see a picture there of Ms. Brigida Trureo and Mr. Claudio Torres. They are farmers, they have their profiles and they give information on what they're good for, what their expertise is. And if anyone wants to contact them, they can find them through the web or a cell phone call. The same idea, but operating through a web page. And I also have some examples of, well, of course, WhatsApp is a great tool, we all know. Uh, there's the case of Uruguay, very interesting. You see the pictures there. Also in Argentina, they have interesting experiences with a virtual agency of INTA. And I'd also like to mention, I don't have enough time, but there's also contests. Contests are a very interesting way of bringing visibility and defining technical references. Um, in this case, the well-known contest of the cup of excellence in coffee. These are very useful and cheap ways to send messages and transfer information. We heard from Luis in his recent presentation. Another mechanism is virtual networks. I have a series of virtual networks here that are promoted in very interesting uh, experiences. There's another one in Chile as well. So more or less 15,000 young people uh, connected every day discussing technology through Facebook, basically. And uh, finally, uh, a very interesting experience from Ecuador where there's strategic coordination of the chain through a WhatsApp group. You have the references there. Again, I don't have the time. Uh, but you can see how the group reacted with the pandemic and how they are working on a strategic plan for the cacao chain. To close, um, in marketing, this is the situation we have uh, in Latin America overall. It is not structured. And Ideally, we have to achieve that structure. There are certain instruments to integrate markets, uh, to bring wholesalers, exporters, stores, public purchases, and internet. So that's the main idea, the concept. This entails uh, preparation of the uh, supply. If we want to market and sell through digital channels, the first thing we have to do is look at productivity, quality, opportunity, and design is truly important. There's a very low cost experience. This was not, uh, there, there was no price tag on this. It was uh, students using their knowledge to produce uh, labels for farmers. So this is a technical institute that is near some of these farmers and produced labels for the farmers. So a low cost solution. Once we have marketing down, we can look at other low cost solutions. What you see here are some pictures of farmers markets and agricultural fairs in Chile and Peru. This is uh, extended throughout Latin America. These are uh, affordable tools and you can truly create physical market spaces that can later take the step towards digitization. Another interesting tool, uh, I'm aware of time, Maria, sorry. We have the virtual round tables, business conferences uh, that are done uh, virtually. This is uh, for wholesalers, uh, so certain large volumes. And then I give you some references there on virtual stores in Brazil. This is work by Antonio Valvain, and he will be sharing in this seminar series. So he will certainly give the details of them. In conclusion, we need public policy to face the post-pandemic world. And as part of these public policies, very importantly, we have to consider sectoral digital agendas. Here I show the case of Brazil and Colombia. These are the two countries that are most uh, advanced in that sense in the region. And 
some more conclusions. There's a new balance between state uh, companies and civil society. There are new ways of doing public policy. We have to move towards sustainable models to have low cost solutions. The digitalization is an instrument. There's a big role for local organizations to play. And finally, the state should always have its unsubstitutable role. It cannot be replaced. You have the references and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Maria Auxiliadora. Thank you, Octavio. I believe that uh, this idea of looking back and coming back to this and rethinking is very important at this point. Have forced us to look at new ways of building processes and strategies and finding ways of doing what we've always done differently. This new reality makes us change our perspective, looking at what we have at our local uh, world so that we can move forward from that. Our next panelist is Dr. Deljerma Chulumbatar. She is known warmly as Delji in Latin America to help it easier for us to pronounce her name. Delji has over 24 years of experience working in agriculture and rural development nationally, regionally, and globally. She is currently Extension Officer at uh, the Office of Extension at FAO in Rome. Her work is a wide range of areas, including institutional reform, public policy, and measures of extension. Uh, good practices, facilitating innovative processes and capacity building for agricultural innovation. LG has a PhD in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. She studied the distribution of uh, rural extension and adoption of technologies by farmers as well as a master's degree in extensive studies in uh, conservation agriculture and agricultural engineering. Delji has been a member of the World Forum for uh, Rural and Extension Services. Rela said is a member of that as well. And Delji is currently vice president of the board of the GFRAS and the for Rural Advisory Services. Delji will be sharing her experience on digitalization of extension services from the perspective of GFRAS. So you have 15 minutes, Delji, and we have over 300 participants uh, hearing you through our social media and the Zoom platform. Go ahead, you have the floor. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Oxlodora, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone, Relacer, for giving me this opportunity to present in this panel and, uh, and be part of this very exciting event. Unfortunately, I'm unable to, my camera is somehow glitching and not turning on. So I apologize for that. But the uh, this is very exciting to be talking about digitalization. No, this is certainly has brought significant changes in our personal as well as professional lives. The way people farm, the way people buy and sell, and engage in industries and policies, etc. No, in 2011, I went to Canada to do my PhD, and once a month, I would buy this calling card. They used to call it international calling card, and I pay 25 Canadian dollars to talk 15 minutes very rough conversation, which I hardly, very poor connection cannot go through. But then in 2020, I spent 15 minutes to buy my parents uh, seeds and seedlings and fertilizers to start their gardening. Just it took 15 minutes. And of course, uh, the COVID pandemic, we cannot talk about digitalization without talking about COVID. No? COVID has accelerated these digital innovations significantly to our 
to our lives. So if I can move the slide. Unlike Fernando, I don't have for personal greetings from my uh, DG. The, however, I would like to share a quote from our Director General. He says, digitalization has become an important driving force for rural transformation and creating new opportunities to farmers. In times of unprecedented challenges like COVID, natural disasters, uh, climate change that affect agriculture and food, as well as rural livelihoods so much, I think digitalization has so much to offer and provides a unique opportunity to accelerate agriculture and food, system, food systems in a sustainable manner. And now I, um, I will be uh, talking a bit of background, which I will go through very fast. Uh, Sandra, uh, Luz, and Octava has covered uh, much of that. And uh, just to touch on what digital promises versus digital realities are like and basic conditions for digitalization, it's not so um, uh, easy and glorious as uh, we seem to see uh, from surface. And then I um, focus a bit on uh, extension advisory services as well as extension advisory systems as a whole and leave you with a few key messages. Okay, so, um, you know, we have huge pressure to build resilient farmers and resilient communities, and re resilient systems and countries to face the challenges that rural producers and agriculture and food sector is facing. Those are many, no? Just to name the few. We still need to find the ways to produce more with less. And there is climate change, natural disasters, disasters and resource degradations. And the number of poor and hungry are still continue to grow. Yet at the same time, access to basic services like health, education, finance is still very poor. And there is huge difference between rural and urban then it comes to agriculture, there is very uh, is still limited access to productive resources and agriculture services, especially those in remote, hard to access areas or vulnerable groups, indigenous groups, women and youth, etc. No? And we continue to face various uh, numerous uh, crises. Digital solutions are big and uh, main broad. There, some of them are transformative and that some of them are disruptive. But any disruptive innovations or disruptions will provide us uh, uh, challenges as well as same time opportunities. So some of the digital promises, what are, you know, it's been said already in our previous uh, panelists, but there is great opportunity to use digitalization to collect data, evidence, and support evidence-based informant policy, investment decisions to facilitate farming and marketing, et cetera. No? And it will increase efficiency and inclusiveness in rural and agriculture services. And uh, they do some of this has, has been mentioned, extension e-finance and social protection schemes, et cetera. And more efficient and transparent value chain and the transparency is very key in this in this context. And to to have trust in people, in trust in the players and actors in the value chain in the system, the system has to be transparent to gain this trust. It enables and digital digitalization also enables uh, integrated more holistic policies for rural transformation. Not the challenges faced by um, rural producers and rural people are not sectoral, they're mostly dimensional. And, and we need to think about integration and holistic approach to address those things. And, and uh, digital platforms and different uh, tools and um, instruments uh, that hopefully will help facilitating that. In job creation or entrepreneurship, which has been spoken, and empowerment of youth and women, and hopefully increase productivity and uh, the investment, the better return on our investment. So at the same time, while there is a lot of promises being made and hopes being put in digitalization, what are the realities that we have today? 
and Sandra have presented very good data on access to internet. Access to internet is not, does not equal to use of internet. You may have access to it, and, but you may not be using it. So those are two different things. However, um, you know, majority of people who have access is in developing world, obviously, and only 20, nearly 20% of the least developed country has access to internet. And um, Sandra talked about gender gaps. And I must say uh, that uh, Latin America is uh, the region which has the least amount of gender gap. Um, I think it was 2%, if I'm not wrong. And uh, network coverage versus use. While 93% of the world population lives in the reach of mobile broadband, so there is a broadband available almost everywhere, but only 53% actually uses the internet for various reasons, no? Mobile phone ownership. Most mobile phone ownership rates are found in Africa and South Asia and highest found in Europe and Latin America in between. Increased mobile subscription does not necessarily equal the distribution. You can have higher density of mobile phone subscription in urban areas and much less in uh, rural areas. So in generally speaking, while digitalization is moving forward in fastest speed and accelerating, there is still a low level of adoption and, and uh, use of uh, this digital benefits. What are the barriers? Why is that? An international telecommunication union identifies few barriers, which I listed here. Uh, lack of electricity, especially in the rural areas. 15% of the world population live without electricity. So this is a huge barrier in structure. And secondly, uh, the literacy. 13% of the world population is uh, incapable of reading and writing. And uh, even when you, if you are left, it does not necessarily mean you have a capacity to make use of the digital technologies and the digital information. Lack of ICT skills, affordability. Octava talked about the low cost homegrown solutions, I, I really go for that. And this is a big barrier. It's very expensive, still very expensive to have access to broadband and local content, no? Lack, lack of appealing and relevant content and uh, relevance of information out there and poor network coverage in the rural areas. So these are some of the uh, barriers to the adoption of uh, digital solutions. And this is also just to show you no know, digital technologies also come with risk. It can do great things, innovations, increase efficiency and inclusion, et cetera. But if it is not managed well and complemented with right policies and right instruments, it can cause um, you know, um, quite a deal of risks, increase inequalities, concentration control, etc. No? Um, so what needs to be done? There is a lot to be done to make the, make the digitalization reach full potential. No? And first, most of all, there are basic conditions that needs to be met. And those basic conditions are both um, soft infrastructure as well as hard infrastructure. And develop, uh, huge amount of development needed in soft side of the digitalization. And it's very critical to, um, to have soft side of infrastructure in place to make use of, <laughs> make a full benefit of the hard side uh, of uh, so um, just to name this few, uh, establishing inclusive, so the digital ecosystem, no? 
creation of inclusive digital ecosystem and enabling environment. Octava also talked about this and capacity development. So fundamental. Digital literacy, skill development of everybody, not only users in the rural areas or clients of extension services, but in all levels, producers, service providers, policy makers, uh, and every level, all the organization, regulatory framework, standards, interoperability, and innovative and effective partnership, par private partner partnership, creating incentives, inclusiveness and sustainability. Private private public partnership is going to be a very, very big, uh, big uh, importance in this. No? And hard and structure, I will not um, talk. It's been already mentioned by others. Uh, just trying to move fast with uh, time. So, you know, um, only when we have the basic conditions are met and the capacities to implement the building blocks here in gray are in place we will be able to harvest the full potential of digitalization in agri-food uh, system. So it's very important to be mindful. Now, what does it mean in agriculture extension and advisory services? No, agriculture extension and advisory services play a role in both two sides. There are two, two things I want to talk about. One is the digitalization in agriculture, no, that is, that is all the precision agriculture practices, smart farming and, uh, and uh, e-marketing, e-commerce, or all, all those things. And then the digitalization and extension itself. So extension advisory services play a role in supporting producers to use benefit from digital technologies and link them to input and output markets as well as access and interpret digital data and information to the specific context and needs. We seem to, some of us seem to believe that, you know, once we transfer the information to producers digitally, they get it in their cell phone, it fixes things. It doesn't. Actually, there is overflow of information, overload of information. And the farmers need to have a capacity to understand the filter through the information they receive and understand and contextualize that information and interpret it in their own context and needs so they actually take benefit of this information. Who does that? And also this is where extension advisory services may have to play a role and so farmers in this, in this uh, process. Second part, digitalization and extension, has also two parts. Okay. One is digitalization in service delivery. That is to adapt, adopt and adapt digital tools and technologies to improve their outreach and services to producers and other clients. You know, now in agriculture innovation system context, uh, we play much more role than just the <coughs> disseminating information to producers, no? So this is one. The second part is to enhance extension advisory service system as a whole. So to use digital tools to strengthen their capacity, monitoring system, governance, coordination, et cetera. So as a system, extension advisory system, and then in its pluralistic context, how can we take advantage of this digitalization and to strengthen our system to be more resilient to shocks. No? Now, this is the first part, digitalization and service delivery. So this is in the middle, the information comes in a digital means to producers mostly or to others. But before that information gets to your tablet to your, to your cell phone, there is various activities needs to be done in the back end, no? Collection of data and information, 
documentation, analysis of those data, and contextualization, interpretation and operating the, the, the software or, um, or, the, or the technology. Then, only then, the farmers or producers have access to or be able to use that information in a meaningful way. And so far, there have been various uh, ways this is being used. You know, there's call centers, community radio, SMS, voice recorded messaging systems, e-commerce marketing, logistics, weather, price information, pest and disease identification and control, information exchange, mainly through social media and, uh, and through the, all of those some um, empowerment. No? And this has been, many of those activities have emerged during COVID pandemic in response to, to the challenges we faced in relation to market access and input, uh, inputs and information. But the state of art technologies are generally used by private actors, agri-tech companies, but public extension NGOs or producer organizations tend to have uh, ICT tools, um, use ICT tools using social media, like uh, rural radio, more con con conventional, uh, let's say, tools. Now, this is in the service delivery. On, on the other side, the digitalization in the extension system. I, I think so far we are reacting to this evolution, reacting to this innovation, disruption, and uh, Maria, I saw your fingers, <laughs> uh, and, and responding to the um, responding to the challenges that we are facing. And I think now we need to change our gear to be more strategic and more proactively use this digital is uh, opportunities within digitalization in strengthening our extension system as a whole. Now, there are many things we can do, which we have started doing. For example, documentation and integration of local know-how. You know, in the past we used to there used to be a seldom books written and documentation of local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, etc. being that. And it is hard to get that out. Now it's our opportunity. And we've been talking about lack of impact of extension, lack of evidence of extension to demonstrate return on investment. Shall we have done something that's worth getting investment? And this is now our opportunity. We can use digital tools means to collect data and develop, create evidence for uh, data-driven decision-making policy processes and investment decisions also. And uh, Octava talked about uh, the budget allocation for extension and the tendency to be continue to be declining. And so, you know, we need to use these opportunities to demonstrate the impact, cross-learning and exchange and capacity development, the mail. The mail has been important issue that's been neglected all these years in extension advisory services, performance measurement. This is where we can do, and the impact with RELASEF, FAO is testing a tool to measure a, a performance and outcome of extension advisory services in four countries in Latin America. And so um, there is lots of, uh, this is an example of how we can use digitalization to fill the gaps that we have not been able to fill so far. Networks, coordination, collaboration, governance, no? The extension advisory services are pluralistic and now coordinating the pluralism country for us their governance is important. Now, other important things, feedback mechanism and quality assurance, responsiveness of the services. This is, again, 
this has not been done effectively. Now this is our opportunity to do so. Demand mobilization. We talk about making extension and advisory services demand driven. And it has been very hard to do. And now digitalization and digital tools will enable us to do it. And facilitation of cooperation of innovation, no? Instead just going information dissemination, technology transfer. Maybe now we can work together and uh, digital using digital platforms to, to uh, facilitate innovation processes. Now, uh, so if we do that, it, our extension uh, and advisory service systems will be more resilient, more efficient, transparent, relevant, inclusive, and well coordinated with synergies among our pluralistic um, actors. Now, this is a five key functions um, of extension and services. And in my opinion, not everything can be or should be digitalized. And now I would like my dear participants to look at these five functions and you can look, put in the chat A, B, C, D, E, which of these five functions should be digitalized, should be or can be digitalized, okay? A, difficulties to scale up and go beyond the, just a minute. Decision support. Uh, sorry, I, I have a little uh, mistake here. A is a knowledge and technology information sharing. A is a knowledge and technology and information sharing. B is capacity, no decision support or advisory on farm, no? More like personal uh, advisory and organizational and business, uh, agribusiness management, no? On farm solutions. C is strengthening of farm, farm based organization collective action, D, human capacity development, E, facilitation, linking, brokering, value chains, okay? So I move on, sorry, I have a little bit of, uh, I have one slide left. This is the key challenges of digitalization and the, oops, this is this which difficulty to scale up and beyond, going beyond project phase. According to a studies, many studies, about 80% of digital, uh, digital innovations or digital solutions fail. Digital projects promoting digital fail because it's too difficult to scale. It doesn't seem to go beyond pilot case. Secondly, capacity to pay for both, by both producers and extension uh, service providers is still very elements of data, quality assurance of the data. And have to make knowledge management of this digital information. There is just too much out there. And it is very hard for the farmers to digest. Lack of incentives and policy framework for PPP and human capacity at all levels, okay? Those are some of the challenges, but those, this is my key messages that I want to leave you with. And this is my last slide. Um, there are three C's and three S's. <laughs> So the main one, C1, capacity development, all levels, horizontally and vertically is the key. Second C, content, co-creation, customization, adaptation, use of relevance, use and relevance by smallholders and local appropriation is very important. The content has to be relevant. And context matters always, no? No one size fits all. S, simple, keep it simple. Simple, it's like more, is, less is more, no? Keep it simple. If you have a simple, it will be more inclusive, easy to scale and more impactful. And sustainability, of course, you know, positive impacts on social, economic, environmental, do no harm and systems approach, integrated holistic approach across all disciplines and sectors. We need to move beyond the sectoral approach. Maria Oxenadora, thank you very much. Uh, here are some cases, but I can share my um, presentation. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Delji. 
for your excellent presentation where you gave us an overview of all of those trigger messages that you um, showed us towards the end. I think that that will provide us with a great deal of food for thought for us to reassess our strategies and uh, revise them in a way so as to digitalize the rural milieu extension uh, services and agriculture as a whole. Our last speaker is Mr. Heiner Baumann. Mr. Baumann is the co-founder and managing director of um, and board member of the Precision Agriculture for Development um, Foundation, PAD. He has over 20 years experience in advising and managing high growth um, social change organizations um, with a focus on climate smart, sustainable agriculture, clean energy, community health, education, and mobile service, mo mobile um, phone based services in Africa, Haiti, the United States, Europe, through the PAD Foundation, um, uh, which he leads. Yeah, currently, he's especially interested in uh, solutions and organizations meant to have um, uh, impact at scale, at scale to fight rural poverty, uh, environmental degradation, climate change, and the fundamental elements that are needed to respond to these challenges that agriculture is faced with around the world um, at this juncture. Mr. Bauman will be speaking about the PAD experience in digital extension from Africa and Asia. Yeah, with that, I will yield to Mr. Bauman. You have the floor, sir. Well, many thanks to uh, Maria, Federico, and all at ICA for organizing this event and bringing us together today. With me is Claudia Carvajal, and she is PAD's Regional Director for Latin America. I will first give a brief overview, then Claudia will present three examples of our specific work, and finally, we will share uh, some takeaways. So PAD was founded six years ago by three professors and myself. One of the professors is Michael Kramer. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2019. Today, we're operating in these nine countries, serving more than 3 million farmers. Our mission is to reduce information poverty by providing actionable, customized information through mobile phones. For farmers, we focus on increasing yields, net incomes, and environmental sustainability. We are a non-profit organization and generally prefer to work with partners who already have trusted relationships with farmers. We are very excited to now start working with government and other partners in Latin America. We are adjusting to regional, national, and local contexts and circumstances. Two projects have already been awarded last month. One in Colombia with RARE and the Nature Conservancy to promote sustainable livelihoods in the Meta Department. And one in Ecuador to support the Inter-American Development Bank and Pro-Amazonia on a digital intervention and evaluation with palm tree farmers. Two more projects are in advanced discussions. They are both in partnership with ECO and respective ministries of agriculture. One is in northeast of Brazil in, and one is in Colombia and both are focused on increasing productivity in smallholder farmers through digital extension. I'm going to skip this next slide because my previous speakers have amply covered the why we are doing this. The sectoral challenge uh, for us is that useful information and productive, um, uh, and productive technologies exist, but small farmers lack access. 
Most of current extension is provided in person through tra traditional in-person channels with the following limitations. It is expensive to run in-person extension system and it is hard to train, deploy, monitor and retain extension officers and agents. Secondly, extension agents have issues reaching farmers, uh, um, the majority of farmers in India, for instance, um, only 6% of farmers there report that they have benefited from advice from government extension officers and 70% of farmers say they have little or no trust in what government officials are recommending. Existing systems are often just one way. And finally, as we have just seen, it is difficult to implement in-person system in crisis times, be that COVID, or be that a conflict. So our solution is to provide customized agricultural advice over mobile phones. And we do this by combining farmer specific information that you see there, what I mean, and public data such as uh, on soil, weather pest outbreaks, and to come up with customized content. Um, that content is then delivered through an appropriate channel. Across our countries, only about 25% of farmers have smartphones and substantially fewer have data plans and internet connectivity. The majority of our advice is delivered over feature phones. In East Africa, we mostly use uh, SMS and in South Asia, we mostly use voice and IVR. These are some of the characteristics of our solution here, as you see on the right. So as you can see here, digital ag solutions are growing very rapidly. In fact, over the last five years, every year, another hundred digital ag platforms have been added. This is from a very recent report about ag platforms, worthwhile to read. Uh, the big question, of course, is are they actually working? Solid scientific evidence is limited, but looking at multiple studies from randomized controlled trials, here is what we find. A meta-analysis of results of seven randomized controlled trials in Africa and India demonstrates a 4% average yield gain associated with digital agricultural programs. This increase, and this is important, is an average effect among all farmers to whom messages were sent including those farmers who never opened or engaged with the content and farmers who actually adopted recommendations saw a significantly higher impact. Another meta-analysis of six studies, four of which were undertaken by PAD, found that on average farmers in the program showed 22% higher increase in adoption of farming practices. And this again with the same preamble that we measured across all farmers who had access to the information irrespective if they used it or not. Given a unit cost of less than $2 per year per farmer at scale, we see a very high social return on investment. I'm passing over to Claudia to give you some very specific examples of our work. Claudia, please. Thank you, Heiner. Um, now that Heiner described the big picture, I will talk about some of our projects. These projects are from different countries and the first ref sorry, and reflect different implementation strategies. Uh, I'm going to start with Odisha with the Amakrushi program. Odisha is our largest program and is currently reaching more than 1 million farmers. This project comes from a partnership between uh, the BLM and Linda Gates Foundation and the government of Odisha. Since, the inception, since, the incep since it is inception, the goal of the project was to reach 1 million farmers and then transfer it to the government as part of our build over transfer model. Uh, just to talk a bit about the features of the service, it's a two-way service in which farmers receive a weekly push call with agricultural recommendations that is customized, but can also call back into the toll-free line, record questions that will be answered by experts. And then there's additional features, like for example, they can access previous advisory messages. This program started with rice and is now providing content on over 20 crops. And we have added additional initiatives that uh, provide a more comprehensive support to farmers. 
Uh, some of those are gender components uh, that I will discuss later. And I just want to touch on the component that Heiner already mentioned on research, that is a key component of our program. We use research uh, in this program and in all of our programs to evaluate and make programmatic decisions and um, learning and innovating allows us to provide a better services to farmers. Uh, this service, uh, the Amma Krishi Service in Odisha, India, engages with farmers at different stages in the process to maximize the relevance of the information and the impact of our services. Farmers are first called by the call center to collect what we call profiling information that will be used to customize messages. Content is then prepared by our ACT team in coordination with partners and review, reviewed by a content review meeting with government experts and research organizations that allow us to make sure that the content is relevant for the specific context and that uh, we are providing the information that the experts on the topic recommend. Farmers can interact with the service to two ways. The first one is through the push calls, but then as I said, they can also call into the hotline and ask questions. Um, Something about uh, the, the, the frequent uh, feedback surveys is that we, as, we, we use this information to inform content design, but also to inform uh, profiling, registration, and the way the farmers interact with the service. Um, one key feature of our model that is very, slightly different from a lot of other models is that we iterate and refine our interventions as we scale and not exclusively at the beginning. Uh, that allows us to deliver the best possible service to farmers. And then I want to talk about um, how we make the content relevant or how we adjust to different settings or, or needs. Um, each country has its own challenges, it can be gender, it can be youth, uh, but in India it was um, gender. So we want to make sure that this works for all groups and not only the most visible male farmers. In, the, in India, we spent a lot of time thinking about gender dynamics and strat strategies to leverage our service for gender engagement. We conducted detailed analysis of the context through desk and field research and identified three main challenges for women. These are probably just a subsample, but those are the ones that were more relevant for our context. Uh, the first one was uh, women had limited decision-making power on staple and cash crops. They, have, uh, they had, however, decision-making power, decision power in other crops. They had limited access to mobile phones and they had low levels of mobile phone literacy. With this information, we um, identify solutions targeted to each challenge. And we are now, for example, implementing strategies on content tailored to women, like horticulture, livestock, and fisheries. We are also partnering with NGOs that have programs fo focused on women. And we can, uh, and uh, the final point is that we are also disseminating content through other platforms that are more widely used and by bypass, but by bypass, sorry, literacy constraints. Uh, one of them is community radio. I, I am now going to move towards uh, the, our um, program in Kenya. Uh, this is our uh, program labeled MOA Info. Uh, the, the development of this program offers another rich example of how PATH is capable of deepening a service over time. This program started as a pest control advisory service in response to the fall armyworm a crisis that at the time was new to the region and was imagining the fields of maize that are the regional, regional staple crop. In response to farmer feedback and growing capacity, the service has been iterated to provide farmers and agro dealers with information on 11 crops and optimal input use, in addition to its foundational pest management service. We have been able to, create a, to learn a great deal of our farmers, and these are some of the key characteristics of what we see. And just to dive a bit into the details of the platform, uh, this platform is also two-way communication. It allows farmers to both pull content, they're looking for information about the crop, but they also receive push messages about farming practices. Uh, one key component that I would like to highlight are the decision, decision support tools um, that help farmers optimize their decision making. These tools, for example, I'm gonna talk about the seed selector tool that uses information on farmers' plot location and preference for maturity duration, and then provides recommendations on the more, on the most suitable varieties of uh, maize and beans. Um, there's a few other examples on the slide. I'm gonna go through this slide very, slide very quickly. Um, it's just to talk about how learning from farmers uh, has uh, allowed us to uh, inform our decisions and how also we see a high levels of adoption um, relatively to other, uh, other interventions. Um, uh, and this 
these um, adoption and knowledge um, numbers are pretty high, particularly when you consider that the service costs less than $2 per farmer per year at scale. Um, and then I want to dive into documentation and A-B testing that are core to our mission. So we conduct A-B testing that is basically comparing two or more uh, service design options to uh, assess which is preferred or more effective. And this informs programmatic decisions and service delivery. To date, we have conducted over 60 A-B tests uh, across geographies. I want to talk about a very quick example in, in, in Kenya. Um, the, the two research questions are, are, about, are about what is the type of message that has the biggest impact and what is the best time to send these messages. So these experiments were randomized and for, um, half of farmers received message A, half of them received message B, and we saw that farmers engage better with message B. And then we did something similar with timing. Um, we randomized this in four groups, uh, 7 a.m., midday, 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. And then we randomly assigned farmers to receive the messages at these times. And what we saw is that midday was, is, uh, was uh, the best option. So what we did is we started sending the message B at midday to, as a way of uh, impact. And the last point that I want to talk about is um, I would like to uh, show uh, talk about the SYNC experiment uh, in, in Punjab, uh, Pakistan. So a zinc deficiency diet can weaken the development of immune system, trigger stunting, um, and contribute to pregnancy complications, among others. So zinc biofortified varieties can tackle this public health issue. And these seeds also have benefits for farmers as they have been be, beyond health, as they have been developed to be disease, disease resistant and are associated, associated with higher yields. So in Pakistan, we, said, we tested our system to focus exclusively on biofortified wheat by highlighting both the health and economic benefits of these seeds. This intervention was done over 17 days because that was a window in which farmers were, uh, were going to buy seeds. So that was like the only time that we had. And the, the, the results are still preliminary, but what we see is an increase, a, a significant decrease in adoption a, a, of these biofortified bio seeds. Um, these are still preliminary results, as I said. And Heiner, do you wanna take the last few slides? Sure, um, thank you, uh, um, Claudio. So just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to skip um, the COVID uh, response that we had implemented. Okay, but I do definitely want to talk about the uh, takeaways here that might be relevant for you or your projects. Um, the first one is customer-centric and, and, and data-driven approach is, is really uh, critical. We at PAD use behavioral sciences to design services, uh, use and experiments to, to test and iterate and improve just as uh, Claudia has uh, shown us uh, right now. Secondly, um, irrespective of how you are funding your digital platform, the fact is that cost really matters. Low costs per farmer means that it is much more likely that a service will scale. I'm not talking about scaling to 10 or 50,000 farmers, I'm talking about millions. At PAD, we started with an average cost of above $40 per farmer per year, and we're currently below $2 per farmer per year. The beauty about digital communication is that the marginal costs are very small. So it's mostly about fixed costs being distributed uh, over users, and we keep those fixed costs low by partnering with and leverage leveraging existing infrastructure of organizations. Third, if we want programs to stick, we need to think about the end game from the very start. So who will be doing the work at scale? Who will be paying for it? For us, we like the build, operate, transfer model where we help our partner organizations get to an extension model that has more impact on farmers, the environment, and that is much more cost effective than the status quo. Anticipating and effectively responding to change is key. Be it that the political landscape is shifting, a pandemic hits, or there is unrest, the services and organizations behind it need to be willing and able to adapt. And lastly, we feel that digital ag is still in its early years and that there is an opportunity for any 
digital ag project out there to contribute to the learning of the sector. That also means to not only be transparent about what is working, but also about what isn't. We look forward to engaging with you through questions either here um, or then offline after this session. We are relatively new to Latin America. We greatly look forward to getting to know many of you and working hopefully with several of you. Thank you, Maria, uh, for and everyone else for organizing. I'm giving the floor back to you. Thank you so much, Heiner. Thank you, Claudia. We will continue. I believe that experiences from the PAD Foundation and what you've done in Africa, Asia, and even what you're starting in Latin America are vital in this new effort to bring digitization to agriculture. I believe we have many questions from our audience. Uh, you can see some of them in the chat box. Uh, because of uh, time constraints, we will ask panelists to refer to the questions that they can answer themselves in the question and answers uh, chat box so that uh, we can help clarify any questions. Uh, I will give the floor to Mr. Mario Leon from AICA. He will be giving our closing remarks for today's seminar and after these wonderful presentations on the world of digitalization in agriculture, perspectives, challenges, and the uh, issues that have been brought up by different panelists. Mario, you have the floor. Thank you, Mario Auxiladora. Once again, I greet each of our speakers. Thank you for joining us and thank you to all the attendees as well. I have just two minutes to close. I'll try and be as concise as possible after having heard from each of our speakers. They have been excellent presentations today. This is the first seminar and it has truly been very productive. Some thoughts I'd like to share with all of you after hearing our panelists is that uh, first we have work to do. It requires an effort from all of us. So we should all partner together to incorporate the most uh, sectors into economic development. This means we have to allocate resources and energy to improve productive human capital. We should support the growth of family farming, and this entails certain productivity conditions, one of which is the use of digital tools or solutions, such as remote extension platforms and electronic commerce platforms. And even the combination of these and the incorporation of other elements to improve competitiveness of our family farmers and their organizations. To understand a text, we need to analyze the context as the saying goes. And We've been able to see an overview and the state of the art of rural connectivity and the needs and requirements, the new skills and competencies in this digital world. We've also heard from the digital divide and the gaps we see in different territories and ways to build bridges to close these gaps with uh, digital tools and solutions. We know that these solutions are a means, but they're not an end in themselves, and they have to be covered in public policies that should respond to dialogue with the private sector and public-private partnerships 
so we may truly have a digital inclusion of these families that are contributing to food production and food security. We have to join our efforts to avoid leading to societies with groups that are excluded or marginalized, uh, whether they're not because they're not digitally literate or they don't have rural connectivity. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Maria Exceladora, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mario. And thank you to all our speakers, as well as all our attendees on behalf of ECLAC, FAO, AICA, RELACER, and the Ministry of Agriculture from Brazil. We thank you very much, and we welcome you to this uh, seminar series. This is just the first of uh, several seminars. And uh, just to let you know, you will have the presentations available at the website for this event. We will be informing you about this. We have all your information. so. We are connected until the end of the seminar series, and we wish to ensure there's added value to all of you so that we may contribute to the digitization of agriculture. Thank you all. Have a good day, a good evening, some of you, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Just to close, we will give the opportunity to participants to have a, an evaluation of the event. So please, I invite you to go to this address, the QR code or the URL you see on screen just to help us with the survey. And we'll also have a communication channel for you to share your thoughts. The first question is, describe in one word what you have learned in today's seminar, and then just add what you, what comes to mind. Thank you, we see some contributions already, innovation, endogenous opportunities, Thank you. Durante la jornada de hoy tuvimos más de 300 participantes entre los los eh, Today we had over 300 uh, participants counting people that are here at the Zoom um, meeting but also following us through social media so we see lots of lessons learned. Thank you all. And lastly, just a short survey of today's activity. Well, I see things are moving fast. There's lots of lessons learned. That's wonderful. Innovation is definitely uh, at the very center and it uh, shows the trend. So, as I said, we'd uh, like to ask your opinion on the talks you heard today. First, the clarity of presentations. Second, the methodology. And third, a general assessment or evaluation. There's a scale of one to 10. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. This information is very important for us to improve future seminars. Thank you, Fernando. So with that, we close the event. Thanks, everyone, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.
Muchas gracias. Thank you. Bye bye. Gracias.